Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Daily Open Chocolate Chat here on The Chocolate Life on Clubhouse. My name's Clay Gordon. I'm the creator and the moderator of thechocolatelife.com, and I'm joined today, as always, by club co-admin David greenwood Hay. David, how are things where you are today? Things are good, thank you. I'm back in the uh, in the lovely sunny north, and uh, I've I, I listened to the recording that you've got pinned uh, of last week's show, an encouragement for this week's show. So I'm looking forward to uh, hearing what you and Michael have got to say. Well, great. Thank you very much. And what I do want to remind people is that um, I, I, I am recording these for podcast purposes. And so uh, what I have done is I have um, posted the podcast from last week's conversation with Michael. So it was the introduction to this series on the history of chocolate in a New York state of mind um, with my special guest today, Michael Iskonis. Hey, Michael, how are you today? I'm well. Good morning, Clay. Good morning. And um, what I want to say to everyone is that um, if you haven't already been to The Chocolate Life, um, you can go to The Chocolate Life if you have a computer and you can read the story the article, the post that Michael wrote about this week's topic. And I was, you know, totally flab flabbergasted when I got the draft for this. Um, it is over 2,500 words long. And, you know, I, I was, you know, expecting a short story. I got a novella, sort of. And, um, I, you know, it's a, it's a really, really fabulous introduction. Um, and so for those of you who are listening and also have an opportunity to look and read and follow along, I would recommend that you do that as well. So let's just dive right in, Michael. Um, one of the things that you know, appears to be really challenging about this period of time is just, you know, just how much documentary evidence do we have about the way chocolate is used in New York City, you know, where the cocoa beans came from, you know, you know, when can we find out when the first cocoa beans were, you know, you know, how easy is it to really get a good feeling for this period of, you know, pre-1800 chocolate in the, Amer in, the, in the Americas generally and in New York specifically? Yeah, it's, it's very difficult. Um, I, I was thinking about this yesterday and I was trying to think of how to describe it. It's almost as if someone gave you um, a puzzle to put together, contains about 100 pieces, and they only gave you about 15 or 20 pieces. It leaves a lot um, of room for speculation. Um, so it's really difficult. Um, I'm relying a lot on work that other scholars have done, uh, that hard work of, of, of going through these old papers where they exist. Um, and yeah, there, there are lots of inferences that we draw and lots of things that are left to our imagination. So it does make this period very challenging to research. So what can you tell us, um, about cocoa coming into the Americas? I know, you know, in the article, you say that the earliest recorded arrival of cacao was aboard a ship into Boston Harbor in 1686 and that's the earliest recorded arrival do we know where those first beans came from and whether they were brought here on a dutch ship or um, a ship of some other origin in that particular record i i'm not sure but but that is the first recorded uh record um <clears throat> but shipping records are very spotty for this period um, there are whole decades worth of, of <coughs> port activity all along the eastern seaboard that is undocumented. So we, we kind of have to assume that unofficially um, smaller amounts of cacao were coming in, uh, primarily from the West Indies. Uh, so at this time we had the Dutch and we had the British, uh, both heavily influencing uh, New York culture and politics, um, establishing colonies in the West Indies. Uh, the two primary sources that kind of dominate the records that do exist uh, show these ships, the ships at least, coming from Jamaica, uh, which was uh, under British control, and Curaçao, a tiny island off the coast of Venezuela, which was a Dutch colony, uh, as well as some from Suriname, uh, another Dutch colony. Um, so we don't know exactly where the cocoa was coming from because that was just the, the point of origin for these ships and and you know so that that 
that that cocoa might have come from another point in that in that journey. Um, but what we do see is a steadily increasing flow um, into the port of New York and other ports uh, like Boston, Philadelphia, and Newport, Rhode Island. <coughs> and uh, and w with that, uh, we see an increasing use of chocolate as a drinking beverage uh, here in the colonies. So not really to belabor the point, but we look about, you know, the founding of New Amsterdam. So by the Dutch, we're looking at the 1620s or thereabouts. And it's about 40 years later when it appears to be transferred from Dutch control to British control. So sometime in the 1660s. And yet, you know, the first records appear to be not in New York, but in Boston, which so you know, thinking about the, the narrative that you just presented, yeah, chalk cocoa beans were probably came into the port of New York, you know, as many as, you know, 40, you know, 20 to 40 years before they came into, uh, before the first recorded uh, shipment into Boston. That, that's correct. You know, when I started looking for, for chocolate in New York, um, you know, I was inspired by, I, I spoke previously about my interest in genealogical research and I had found a, a, a Dutch cousin uh, or you know a cousin of a direct ancestor of mine um, was a fairly early arrival in New Amsterdam he was here by the 650s or the 1650s sorry um, and I was like well if I can find this guy Johannes Vervelen in New Amsterdam you know, brewing beer, I can find chocolate. And it was really difficult to find. I've only found one reference to any sort of Dutch era consumption. And it was in a history of New Amsterdam that was written in the 19th century. And it just described sort of an overall, um, sort of, I guess you could call it a party vibe, um, when, you know, the Dutch citizens of New Amsterdam had a had a celebration. They were celebrating a holiday. Um, they would eat waffles and drink chocolate. Um, and that's that one sentence is the only reference I can find to chocolate existing um, on Manhattan as New Amsterdam uh, prior to the to the 1700s. You know, about this time, you, you mentioned that you had spoken with Deborah Prinz, Rabbi, Rabbi Prinz, uh, and her book, which focused on sort of the Jewish legacy of um, cocoa and chocolate and its influence on modern day, um, on modern day uh, um, distribution of cocoa and chocolate around the world. And, you know, what we have this, what we think about is um, this, un, what people might think of as being unconnected is the Spanish Inquisition. And, you know, many people may know of the Spanish Inquisition, you know, more through Monty Python than anything else. But it is, um, it is important to remember that the Spanish Acquisition or the Spanish Inquisition started really at a very early time. So in the late 1400s, so 1475, you know, 1480 or thereabouts. And, you know, by the time Christopher Columbus has arrived in the New World, we're starting to see um, a huge um, push towards, among other things, the banishment of um, Sephardic Jews out of Spain into Basque France. And what is the connection that you find there in terms of the early historical connection to the cocoa and chocolate in New York City? Yeah, this is a really fascinating story. And... Um... I, I recommend uh, looking into um, Deborah Prince's book uh, on the chocolate trail. As the Sephardic Jews are being expelled from from Spain and kind of moving moving northward into Europe, um, again, this is around you know it, it wasn't it wasn't an overnight thing. It, it was something that that took place over over decades and nearly a century. Um, but eventually, uh, the migration of the Sephardic Jews and chocolate spreading into Europe would sync up, um, as you say, in the, the Basque region of France, specifically in the town of Bayonne, uh, which was known for um, its, its chocolate makers. The town of Bayonne and, and later France also um, kicked the Jews out 
um, and for a time that they had uh, protection under the Dutch. Uh, so we saw migration into um, the Netherlands. The Dutch involvement in the West Indies um, also took um, some of these Sephardic Jews into the West Indies. So by time um, the first Jewish community started arriving in New Amsterdam in the 1650s, um, there was over generations <clears throat> this, this experience and knowledge of chocolate both from the manufacturing and from the trading aspect. So some of the first merchants involved in the cocoa trade um, in, New Am in New York City um, were some of these families um, with this tradition. So uh, specifically the Gomez family uh, and Daniel Gomez in the early 1700s, another um, prominent merchant of this time uh, was Nathan Simpson. Um, and from what we understand, they made their own chocolates, um, perhaps not by their own hands, but we'll discuss that later. Um, but, but they really um, uh, made, made up a really strong network of cocoa trade, among other things, that did eventually extend up into other colonies as well. So um, I want to let people know that um, during the course of not only today's room, but in, in subsequent rooms, both Michael and I are going to be referring to a number of authors and books. And I maintain on the chocolatelife.com a post which is called The Chocolate Life on Clubhouse. And if you go to last week's um, listing, so um, what you'll do is you'll find a link to um, a resource folder. And in that resource folder, there is um, a, a, a Google document as opposed to PDFs and, and images and things like that. And in that document, what you'll do is you'll find a reading list. And what I can do is, uh, if you go there, what you'll do is you'll find links to the books that Michael and I are mentioning over the course of, um, over the course of this series. And at which point I want to do a quick reset of the room. We're here in the daily open chocolate chat on the Chocolate Life on Clubhouse. I'm here with David Greenwood Haig, club co-admin, and our special uh, featured guest today, Michael Lysconis. And we're talking about a history of chocolate um, from a New York state of mind or in a New York state of mind. And we're specifically looking at the period of 1750 to 1800. Uh, so, Michael, um, do we know anything about, you know, what that, what the chocolate that was being made in this period looked like or tasted like? Is there any archaeological evidence, any recipes, anything that gives us a clue to what people are what people are making at this time? Sadly, there, there, to, to my knowledge, there has been no chocolate discovered archaeologically. Um, so again, it leaves a lot to the imagination. But if, if we if we kind of place ourselves in this. In this environment, um, we have uh, the raw material, um, which we can assume has been treated with with some degree of, of post harvest, so it's been fermented and dried. Uh, it has been sitting in a um, the hull of a schooner or a brig, a sailing vessel um, that made at minimum the, the three to four week journey up from the the, the West Indies into New York Harbor. Um, so probably some, some humidity, uh, perhaps involved. Um, so we don't have, you know, know much about how the, the, the cacao was stored. Um, although it was, <clears throat> it's documented that it was stored in bags and barrels. Um, and in terms of the methods, um, really, I, I think the methods varied considerably. Um, both um, in terms of volume, um, a lot of chocolate was being prepared in the homes, at least of those that were wealthy enough to have a staff of servants um, or, or slaves to prepare chocolate in the home for them in very small quantities by hand. Uh, but even the chocolate makers, we assume, um, even if there were mills that were, say, operated by wind, water, or animal power, there was there was certainly perhaps one um, one or more aspects that that were um, manual in, in that grinding. So, Michael, before before we jump away from that topic, um, so 
I mean, my understanding is a lot of the early grinding of cocoa beans, which might have been done at large scale. So um, if I don't have um, house staff, um, might have been slaves um, or indentured servants um, working in my house, um, that this would have been done at a mill. And that mill might have been also processing wheat. It could have been processing corn. It could have been grinding lots of other things uh, at the, you know, in addition to cocoa beans. Is that correct? Yeah. So, so there, there wasn't so much chocolate being made that I, I, I don't, I don't, I wouldn't understand it that um, too many chocolate makers focus solely on, on that task. So if you um, owned a mill, um, you were probably milling all kinds of things. Um, you might have dedicated mills for different purposes, depending on how big your operation was. Um, but uh, you were certainly grinding things like mustard. It was very common, actually, well into the, the 19th century. You see lots of businesses that um, make chocolate and mustard, even Ghirardelli. Um, some of the very earliest ephemera, I, I don't own it, but I've seen it. Um, some, some early invoices I've seen from Ghirardelli out in San Francisco show that in addition to uh, cocoa products, they also ground mustard, which is kind of fascinating. Um, and so I'm, you have the I'm sort of horrified that it also looks like some of them were also grinding pigments for paints and other things like that. Pigments, oils, various grains. Um, so, so yeah, so that, that calls into question, um, you know, what kind of flavor transfer might have occurred mm -hmm. just, just in the manufacturing process, let alone the storage process, because I'm sure they weren't wrapping these, um, these roughly hewn cake of untempered and largely unsweetened chocolate. These, these weren't being wrapped in um, uh, paper with a, a, a solid uh, moisture and odor barrier, as we think of today. Um, so, so there were lots of opportunities for this chocolate to kind of pick up off flavors all the way from, you know, the raw material being shipped in to the manufacturing process to storage uh, once the chocolate was made. And, but then keep in mind also this wasn't um, an eating chocolate. Uh, these blocks or cakes that were formed um, were meant to be graded. Um, in, in, into beverages. So, um, you know, one, one of the, the, the examples that I can throw in here is one of the earliest uh, chocolate makers in New York that we actually can place both the name and a location to um, is John Roosevelt. Um, and yes, it's that Roosevelt family um, that we associate with wealth and power over the centuries in this, in this country. Um, and he, I believe John was the third generation born in uh, New York or, or New Amsterdam prior to that. Um, and, and he appears to have owned a fairly large, for its day, a fairly large milling operation um, that included flour, uh, chocolate, and, and other materials. Um, that would have been the, the large scale end of things, um, but I imagine there was a lot going on with chocolate on a smaller scale as well. So, all right, so you know, I, I'm, I'm looking at what it is that you've written here, and it, it looks like um, in this period of 1750 to 1770 or thereabouts that the manufacture of chocolate is not necessarily something which is, you know, is only done by male-owned businesses. So you mention um, a woman by the name of Rebecca Gomez, um, and another one by the name of Susanna, what looks like Daly. You know, I'm looking at, you know, Rebecca Gomez's, what you've written about here, at number 57 Nassau Street at the corner of Ann. You know, I lived at Nassau and John Street for quite some time, which is literally just a block away from there. And I had no idea of the connection of the history of chocolate into that location. I mean, if I went down there now, would I see anything in the way of historic marker or anything which connected it? And how prevalent was, you know, the presence of women in the early manufacturing of cocoa and chocolate in this area? Well, well taking the first part of that, yeah, I mean, that that's really what, a large part of also what inspired me to, to get into all this, this work. Um, 
was I, I started working and living downtown in lower Manhattan. Um, if if um, for, for those of, of you who um, do have access to uh, the posts and the images, uh, if we look at the map um, that's offered as part of this post, that's say uh, uh, a plan of the city that was published in 1789. To give you some context, so I mentioned that our uh, uh, our, our chocolate lab at the Institute of Culinary Education um, uh, is, is in this neighborhood. Um, to show you specifically where, if you if you zoom in and kind of go to the north or Hudson River, actually the the physical location of our facility would actually be about where the O in or <laughs> is. Um, yes, we uh, 250 years ago we would have been in the middle of the Hudson River. Um, so the, the island of Manhattan uh, on the lower end has been built out considerably. Um, but, but that kind of gives you some context of, of the rich um, uh, locations that started to emerge uh, as I started doing this research. So, so yes, I, I, I could do a walking tour for like the four people on the planet that would be interested in this, but unfortunately nothing no original structures survive from this period. I mean, at best, there's what is it? Uh, Francis Ta Tavern um, mm -hmm. is, is probably one of the only buildings from the 18th century that still stands. Maybe some things um, along what's called South Street Seaport today. Um, but yeah, it, it, when I get out of the four train at Fulton Street um, to start my, my final walk into the lab, um, I'm actually emerging the subway on the very corner where a chocolate maker, Peter Lowe, had his his factory at uh, Maiden Lane and Broadway. Um, as I walk, you know, further down Liberty Street, uh, I'm passing, you know, <clears throat> um, space where there would have been sugar refineries back in, in, in the 18th century. So it is really fascinating to kind of try to see see underneath all the layers of everything that's been built up since then to kind of imagine um, yourself walking the streets a, a few centuries ago. Actually, it, just kind of jumping ahead a couple hundred years, one of the, the, the more interesting moments of, of serendipity was when, when I was living downtown, um, my local hardware store was Tribeca Hardware at 154 Chambers Street. And I was going in there either for, for personal or for, for work reasons, you know, almost once a week. And it wasn't until I'd been in there probably a dozen times that I realized that very location, 154 Chambers Street, was the first factory, uh, the site of the first factory of a guy named John Hawley, who would later um, start a company called Holly and Hoops, which would become one of the largest candy manufacturers in the company uh, in the country in the early 20th century. So, so yeah, so that that was a, a really interesting thing that comes out of all this is is walking these very streets. You to know, go I back to your, so so yeah, so the um, the discovery of Rebecca Gomez. That's something that um, I discovered through through Deborah Prince. Um, it, it is really fascinating because she is. Um, She's related to Daniel. So yes, yeah, so this is this is um, now like three generations of the Gomez family. Uh, Daniel's brother Mordecai uh, married Rebecca, and when Mordecai um, passed away, the business appears to have gone to Rebecca and and her son Moses. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just it's remarkable. I'm looking, you know, even though I edited this article that you wrote. Um, you know, I, as I was editing it, I was thinking more about grammar and punctuation and, you know, the, the rhythm and the flow on the page. And you mentioned it and I wasn't really paying attention. But if we, you know, we think about, you know, you know modern political dynasties and where some of those modern political dynasties started, you know, you mentioned that the Roosevelt's, you know, and, you know, this is, you know, Franklin and, and Teddy, um, you know, one of the early chocolate makers, so Jan, John or Johannes Roosevelt, um, had mills which he handed down to sons and that John or one of his sons would have moved out onto Long Island into Oyster Bay, which is, you know, still there on Long Island. And that is where the Roosevelts of today 
uh, came from. I mean, it, just this connection into the history and these threads that we're pulling apart are just really, really, you know, I think, you know, profoundly fascinating in, in, at some level. Yeah, and actually the, the Roosevelt's at that time, apart from being, you know, wealthy merchants and, and emerging political figures, even on a local level, um, they, they were really well known. It would have been um, John's nephew, uh, Isaac Roosevelt, um, was, was big in the sugar refining. So a lot of people also don't realize that, that one of the, the big industries of colonial New York was sugar refining. Um, and that, that's actually an industry that, that stayed in New York to some degree right up to uh, the early 2000s uh, over in Brooklyn. Um, but yeah, these, these family ties are really fascinating. So I mentioned Peter Lowe, who's you know the, the, the ghost of his chocolate factory I walk by when I emerge from the subway. Um, he was actually Roosevelt's nephew, um, the son of his sister, Rachel. And, th and this is actually where all the genealogical research experience comes in handy because I, I can go to these sources and and kind of tease out some more nuance of, of who these people were. Mm. Um, but we find we find this for another hundred years. We find these interesting family dynasties and, and interwoven relationships. Some of the chocolate makers, I, I either imagine um, that they got into the chocolate making business because they married into it or perhaps um, a chocolate maker married his daughter off to another chocolate maker that he knew. Uh, we, we can only speculate as to, to how these relationships formed, but we see these, these really interesting um, business and family relationships develop for, um, for several more decades in New York, which suggests that it was competitive, but also I'd like to think there was some degree of a sense of community among these chocolate makers. Who knows? Right. And so to what extent do you think, you know, looking at, you know, trying to trace the history of these chocolate makers is uh, because you said that there appear to be distinctive styles that chocolate tended to be thought of as Newport chocolate or Boston chocolate, I suppose, then also New York chocolate and Philadelphia chocolate. And so, you know, it was, you know, number one or the best Boston chocolate or the best Newport chocolate, not necessarily associated with a particular maker. That's that's that that generally holds true. So so I'm actually deep into writing the piece that will lead into next week's chat um, in the early part of the 19th century. It's only then that we really see um, a bit of a personality attached to to chocolate. Um, at this point, it's very much at least from the uh, newspaper advertisements that sell it, um, it's 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 pretty much marketed as a generic product. Um, but the, but there is intercolony trade, um, so we do see chocolate being sold by New York merchants, and and they are generally labeled as if, if with anything at all, it'd be Boston chocolate. They sometimes uh, attach these quality grades. Uh, number one or number two, who knows what that meant. Um, but it's again, it's not until the 1800s that we start to see both some personality, um, but also um, the nuances in how the chocolate was labeled. I don't want to give too much away because it's going to be really <laughs> exciting when we talk about that next week. Got you know, I got you. I understand. Um, and you know, again, reading today's article, you know, what we do find is that. Um, you know, Rebecca Gomez, um, in her stand at 57 Nassau Street, sort of remarks that her product is being promoted as super fine, free of any sediments, and pure, manufactured in the best manner. So even this time, you know, 240 years ago, we find people using superlative marketing language in terms of distinguishing their products from other people. Yeah, you know, and, and through our... 21st century lens and all of our associations with chocolate and our our modern standards um, we, we probably have this tendency you know and this this kind of happened to me and I, I kind of chuckled when I first read it I, I worked on a piece with a journalist a, a couple years ago about this time period in, in chocolate and when it was published um, if it wasn't the title it was in the lead it was something like 
yes, we made chocolate in colonial America, but it didn't taste very good. So I kind of chuckled at that when I first read it. But when I thought about it more, you know, yes, through our, our, our modern lens, we probably would look back and, and at this chocolate as being primitive, as being coarse, as being bad. You know, but I, as, as pastry chef, as someone who makes a little bit of chocolate now and then, you know, I, I kind of want to give these makers the benefit of the doubt. And, and I would assume that some of them were craftsmen who wanted to do a good job and were probably innovating in their own ways. So I don't, I don't like the, the blanket assumption that it was just bad. Um, maybe maybe we, we would see technical flaws through a modern lens just because they, they might have lacked means and methods to um, reduce the acidity of chocolate, things like that. Um, We'll, we'll never know, but but I, I'd like to give these makers the benefit of the doubt that they were trying to make something delicious. No, I you know I given given what it is that we know about technical proficiency in making beer and wine and in spirits manufacturing, even then, I I can very very well imagine there were people who were very diligent in producing. You know, there were products of very very differing qualities. At this point, um, I'd like to say it's uh, 10.30. We're about halfway through today's daily open chocolate chat on the Chocolate Life on Clubhouse. I want to say thank you to my club co-admin, David greenwood Hague and to Michael Lysconis, who's our special guest today. What I'd like to, um, at this point, uh, say to people who are in the audience, if you do have a question for Michael or a comment that you'd like to make, please raise your hand and we will invite you up on stage so you can ask that question and um, or make a comment, uh, an observation, and we'll address it um, the best way that we can, incorporate it into um, today's room. So um, so there are a couple of people who've asked questions. Cesar, how are you today? What question do you have for us here today at the Daily Open Chocolate Chat? Good morning, uh, everything, uh, everyone, and thank you very much for, for the for the session and the information about uh, the history of chocolate, uh, especially of, about uh, cacao. It's very interesting. My question is regarding uh, the how popular it was chocolate in the, that uh, period of time that we are talking uh, today. Um, I, the idea that I have is that uh, it was only available for uh, let's call it uh, royalty people or for people with uh, um, very uh, 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 very wealthy people who were who was able to afford to pay for chocolate but i'm not sure about that so i i understand that it was with the uh, 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 industrial revolution that uh, that chocolate became uh, popular but I don't know uh, at that uh, period of time that you're talking today. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Cesar. That's a really good question because, um, yes, it, it's true to a certain extent that that cocoa and, and chocolate were expensive. And when we can we can see this by not only by who was selling it um, in, in terms of, of the, the, the raw cacao um, and, and the finished chocolate, I, I've tried to think of, 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 a, of a modern day analogy, like what kind of store would exist that might resemble um, at least the inventory of some of these 18th century merchants? Because basically they're just selling anything exotic that came in off of these sailing ships into the harbor. So you might have imported food goods, but then you have uh, fabrics and, and hides coming in from all over the world. Um, Basically, dealers of fancy goods of all different different sorts. So that, that is that there is that implication that yes, um, chocolate was 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 probably relegated to the wealthy. But the reason why I, I, I think this period is interesting, and part, partly why I chose 1750 as a as a launching point, is because I think we see the slow democratization of chocolate and the accessibility. It's slow. Um, but it seems to creep in more and more into into the culture, into the, the daily life of more and more people um, in this period as we as we lead up into the 19th century. Um, you know, for example, yes, the the wealthiest citizens of New York were were potentially making this in their own homes with the the help of of a staff, um, but it was also 
we have evidence that it was also being sold as a, as a finished beverage, as a prepared beverage in the street. Um, the featured image for the, the blog post um, is, is a, a painting that was done of what was known as the fly market, which was a large open air um, market that, from what I understand, extended for two or three blocks um, along Maiden Lane in Lower Manhattan. The, the painting was 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 painted in the the 19th century, um, but I believe it was it was painted to depict what it would have looked like in this period. Um, and there there was evidence of um, vendors who were selling alongside coffee and maybe small pastries, uh, selling prepared chocolate uh, right out in the open. So that suggests that being out on the street, that it was a little bit more accessible um, beyond just the wealthy. Did New York have a coffee house, uh, sorry, a chocolate house, seen like London did 100 years previous? Uh, yes, exactly. Um, the, 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 the coffee house tradition <clears throat> was certainly um, imported along with um, English settlers. Um, and I, I didn't include it in the piece because it, it is kind of a, another one of those convoluted stories. But probably the most famous coffee house of this period was the Tontine Coffee House. And it was here that um, a lot of business deals were done and a lot of um, socializing among the wealthy merchant class. And I believe that part of the land that that coffee house was built on um, was, so, was sold by or contributed um, to by the, the Gomez family, the, this, this uh, cacao merchant family. So again, you can tie all these threads uh, back to some of these same people. Did, did it split into political dynasties like, uh, like it did in London as well? Because they tended to be down party lines, didn't they? You mean the, the, the preference for certain uh, beverages? No, no the, the, the houses, if, you, if we look at London uh, cocoa houses, they, they were very politically biased. So whites, for example, was Tory, uh, et cetera. I, I, I imagine the, the, same, the same types of trends happened here as well. That, that's one area I haven't gone down too deeply into. Sorry, in terms of the products, again, um, it is so interesting to know that um, it was a kind of a culture to drink chocolate, which uh, probably we have uh, lose that um, uh, that habit uh, because uh, normally what we have, uh, most of the things that we have right now, it is uh, candy chocolate bars. So at some point, I guess that it took over um, uh, candy chocolate bars over chocolate and uh and beverages as well, uh, I, I guess, uh, hot beverages. Uh, the thing is that uh, it was only until, um, again, uh, the Industrial Revolution that uh, cocoa powder was available. Uh, so then, uh, as a byproduct of uh, obtaining uh, cocoa butter, they had that uh, remaining uh, product that probably they needed to do something. Uh, they, they just decided to add uh, Loaded, uh, uh, load the product with sugar and make candy chocolate available for the for the population in general. Am I am I right on that uh, way of thinking? Yeah, yeah, you're right. You know, in in this this period in the the 18th century in the 1700s, um, yes, chocolate is is a beverage and it is made from uh, primarily cakes of what we would call today chocolate liquor. Um, so simply ground um, roasted cocoa beans. Um, there, there is some suggestions that some were adding some sugar, some might have been adding some spices. Um, as we were saying before, it's, it's, it's plausible that some spices were added to cover up some off flavors that might have been inherent in, in, in some of the cocoa beans. Um, but yes, this, this, was a, this was a time when it was a beverage. Um, and as you say, it, it is the um, increased mechanization and some of the innovations that would occur trying to parse out the origins of that. It's also very murky. You know, who was the first person to kind of look at this beverage and, and, and start to dream up 
confectionery applications. It's, it's really hard to do. But my theory is, is that it, it's mostly being influenced by um, continental Europeans. Um, so, so just to kind of tease out a little bit of what we're going to talk about next week, uh, we're going to start talking about the French a little bit more. Because I think certainly in New York City, um, French chocolate makers uh, who started coming to New York uh, had a huge influence on, on driving that, that evolution and development of chocolate into confections. And I also want to point out um, really, really quickly um, is that um, at the time, and please correct me if I'm, if I'm wrong, Michael, but at the time, sugar would have been considered to be a spice. And so thinking about sugar in addition to um, perhaps uh, nutmeg and cinnamon and other things which are coming from the Caribbean um, w would have been natural. And of course, you know, sugar was the ingredient that um, the Spanish added to chocolate to make it palatable in the first place. Yeah, I mean, you know, you, you can never you can never decouple sugar from the chocolate conversation. You know, you, you you could say that the the continued rise of chocolate consumption um, was really only possible with a a, a tandem rise in sugar production, um, and and at this time too, sugar it, it was expensive. Um, and it would have probably been sold in, uh, they often referred to them as loaves. So even working with sugar required some processing, some, some, some breaking up and grinding. Um, but yeah, I mean, sugar is so, so important to the, to the conversation with chocolate. Um, and it's, it's, it's really, I, I think those, that those first, additions of sugar to solid chocolates and experimentation with eating chocolates. Um, although the, the earliest versions, what I, what I, what I kind of get out of that, uh, those descriptions is they were, they were basically almost seen as emergency rations. Like if you were, if you were out on a journey and you needed a quick hit of energy, you can, you know, munch on this, you know, probably, probably coarsely ground, but lightly sweetened, you know, chocolate pastille, for example. Great. So we're uh, at 1045. Uh, so we're about three quarters of the way through today's um, daily open chocolate chat here on the Chocolate Life on Clubhouse. And we're talking about the period of 1750 to 1800, roughly, with our special guest today, Michael Iskonis. And, you know, Michael, uh, I think that there are, you know, two things which we have alluded to. One thing, actually, one thing we've alluded to, but there are, you know, two big topics that are sort of left in this period. Number one is, um, to what extent do we know about indentured servitude or slavery? Um, and it's... Um, prevalence in the early days of manufacturing of chocolate in the in New York City um, and um, what do we what do we know about you know the use of chocolate in and around the Revolutionary War yeah so you know I, I'm not I'm not an economic or a political historian um, and I, I, I learned history in the same public school system that, that most other people do. So when we, when we, we kind of learn about um, colonial America and colonialism in general, um, you know, we, we do get kind of a whitewashed version um, that we don't have to get into here. Um, but, but certainly we, we, we have to acknowledge that um, the American colonies and certainly the cocoa trade that developed um, as, as one of, of, of many items being traded um, from the West Indies into North America back to Europe was all part of this triangular trade system that um, moved in, in different directions. It moved raw materials, it moved finished goods, and it also moved slave labor primarily from, from West Africa. Uh, so slave labor was being used on the cocoa plantations, um, which is probably generally understood. Um, 
But once that raw material comes into the American colonies, um, certainly in the North, we, we still tend to think of um, slavery in this country, you know, even in the, the, the 18th century, we kind of still tend to think of it as this North-South divide. Um, but New York was actually of the 13 colonies, um, by, the, by the numbers, um, New York colony had the second highest number of slaves uh, out of the 13 colonies. Um, so slave labor is tied to chocolate in this sense, in that a lot of these merchants that were um, trading and manufacturing cocoa um, owned slaves. And we, you know, that, that's another thing when, when we talk about this history, like John Roosevelt made chocolate. I'm gonna guess John himself Maybe in this particular case, John wasn't grinding cocoa beans, but he certainly had people in his employ that were that were doing that actual physical labor. Um, so, so the merchant families owned slaves, and and through the research, um, I also discovered that some of these these other chocolate makers um, also had slaves. So, um, the the first discovery was Peter Lowe, who we mentioned at, at Maiden Lane and Broadway. Um, you know, one of the handful of references that I can find for him in, in, in the research um, is an advertisement that he posted in the newspaper, um, basically offering a reward for one of his slaves who ran away. Um, There's another chocolate maker who eventually was making chocolate in New York City, but at the time in the 1750s, he was in Philadelphia and he was offering for sale an indentured servant. He refers to her as a Dutch girl who has three and a half years left to serve in her contract. Um, but, but basically selling her to, to someone else. Um, I'm really, really interested to read more of the work, the forthcoming work by a uh, history professor at the University of Tennessee, I believe, uh, Christopher Magra who it's from what I understand is, is writing a book on slavery and food production in this period. And he wrote an article for a historical society in Rhode Island uh, that kind of zeroes in on um, one particular story. Um, and, and we've linked to it in, in the blog post, um, sort of a, of a teaser on, on, on Christopher's website. And I actually know a little bit about um, the slave that he is writing about um, by the name of Prince Updike. Um, he was actually a slave. He was owned by um, Aaron Lopez, who was in the cocoa trade, or, or at least he made chocolate for Aaron Lopez, because sometimes um, the masters of these slaves would would essentially lend the slaves out to do labor for, for other people. Uh, but Aaron Lopez was part of this network of um, cocoa merchants with this Sephardic Jewish um, heritage. So um, it's, a, it's a really uh, fascinating, it was, it was kind of disappointing. <laughs> you know, what you're doing the research on these people and you're, you're investing this time and you know, you're, you're almost kind of rooting for them. And then, then you discover, oh, oh man, he, he owns slaves. That's kind of a drag. Um, but, but it's really important to kind of confront that and to kind of understand. Um, it, it's a lot of our, of our history kind of overlooks that, especially here in New York. Um, so, so yeah, the, the whole thing has been quite fascinating to kind of discover. So when you talk about the teaching of American history, Michael, you know, again, as somebody who grew up in, in the same sort of educational system, you know, we didn't, you know, the only thing we know about beverages and the American Revolution really is that you know, at some point, you know, rebels threw casks of tea into Boston Harbor. But when we look through Sophie and Michael Coe's book, um, The True History of Chocolate, what we do is we find out that, you know, because cocoa beans came from, you know, South America, Central America, and the Caribbean, and tea everything channeled through Britain, that in some respect, chocolate became um, a, a beverage of the revolution, that um, if you were on the American side, or what would become the American side, the colonies, as opposed to the British side, you preferentially drank chocolate as opposed to drinking tea. Is that, is that a good understanding? 
that that's my that's exactly my understanding yeah so yeah, it might it might be you know hyperbolic to say it was a patriotic beverage per se but but in in many cases it probably was right and similarly, I mean, there are reports that uh, you you mentioned that chocolate would become a high calorie, you know, uh, you know, um, food that if you were out um, expending lots of calories hunting or, or 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 exploring or something like that, that chocolate was actually a part of the ration for Washington's troops. That um, it was you know, part of part of what they were, you know, like the British Navy gave sailors rum. Um, Washington gave his troops chocolate. Yeah, I, I understand that to be true as well. And that, and that actually, you know, goes back to something that Cesar asked about um, access and, and who was consuming chocolate. That, that's another uh, facet that I, or aspect that I point to in, towards that democratization. Like if it was this, um, you know, luxurious um, item that, that was out of reach of many, it, it wouldn't have been in soldiers' rations. So that, that's another thing that I point to and, and as evidence of, of its, its uh, greater popularity and, and access, for sure. Right. And as we sort of wind down this hour, I, I want to remind people if, if anybody has a question that they'd like to ask Michael about anything around this period or something that Michael has said, um, please raise your hand. We'll bring you up on stage to ask that question. But Michael, I mean, if there's sort of one sort of mythologized story about the early history of chocolate in the colonies that I think that most of us know, it's around these guys, Hannon and Baker. And what can you tell us about that whole mythologizing process? You know, what really went on there? Sorry, just something before you go into that uh, subject. I I just want to say uh, another uh, note on the same uh, line that you were mentioning about uh, the revolutionary drink. Because uh, in South America, uh, I don't know if uh, you are familiarized with the history, but Simon Bolivar, who was the, the leader of the revolution in northern South America against the Spaniards, uh, his family owns uh, a large uh, farm. Uh, at the time was was called uh, the the Great Colombia, but uh, nowadays is Venezuela. So at uh, and at that time, uh, uh, Bolivar financed all most of the revolution with his fortune, uh, coming from a cacao farm called San Mateo in Venezuela. That farm still exists, and it's very interesting because the uh, the family of Bolivar he was uh, he, they were exporting uh, cocoa beans to Europe at the time. So m- a lot of money from the from that revolution came from from cacao as well. That that's really fascinating, and, and that's that's something I'm just starting to do. I've 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 had the the lens so tightly focused on New York City, um, just 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 to avoid going down too many um, rabbit holes. But but part part of what this project with with Clay and 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 these chats has done is it's it's started to allow me to kind of pull back and look at what what was happening throughout the rest of the world um, in these periods and 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 chocolate's role in, in so many things. So I, I find these stories like really fascinating and I'm, I'm slowly starting to understand, you know, what was happening um, in other parts of the world, especially the, the, the cocoa growing and, and still consuming uh, parts of the world at that time. So, so thanks for sharing that. Yeah. So Michael, um, what about Hannon and Baker? I mean, what do we yeah. what do we know about you know the 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 lore that may be legendary? What could be fact, and what do we take out of what do we take away from that? Well, if we just look at the conventional storytelling, as 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 most um, even historians will will tell it, um, that the first uh, chocolate factory in Colonial America was um, uh, founded by uh, John Hannon in Dorchester, Massachusetts, outside of Boston. Um, and 
he would end up um, dying actually on a trip to source cocoa beans. I, off the top of my head, I can't remember where he was at the time, um, but he was financed um, by a guy named James Baker. He's often referred to as a doctor, James Baker. From what I understand, he was not a doctor, um, but he he liked to use that that prefix. Um, so when Hannon died, uh, Baker took over uh, the mills, the factory, um, and then it was his son Walter who uh, by 1780 into the 1800s um, really started to grow uh, both the factory and the brand. So, and, and of course it would become, you know, arguably the most iconic chocolate and cocoa brand throughout the 19th century in this country. So obviously, as, as we've explored just, just from the last, you know, 55 minutes, um, there were dozens and dozens of chocolate makers uh, throughout the colonies that predated Hannon and then Baker. Um, but it's, it's, I guess it's a convenient hook to, to kind of hang the history of American chocolate on um, because it was a brand that persisted and certainly their own marketing um, over the years, um, you know, certainly imprinted that in, in many people's minds. Uh, but Baker was not the first, obviously. Um, the, the one concession I will make is that, you know, this is sort of the, the very, very early days of the Industrial Revolution. So we're talking about the, uh, uh, the latter half of the 18th century. Um, we, we don't know exactly what type of equipment and machinery uh, Hannon and then Baker would have been using. But I will concede that perhaps um, the Baker Company was among the first to produce at a scale that allowed them to sell their products beyond the immediate regional area. Um, so we start to see Baker, you know, in, in the 19th century, we start to see Baker products basically creeping in everywhere. Um, that's something I've was been working on the last couple of days is, is trying to understand the reach of the New York chocolate makers, you know, were their products being sold outside of the region? And there are factors that that, that certainly contributed to, to um, how far those products could go. Uh, but as we get into, by, I would say by 1850, um, that market dominance and certainly the legend uh, that surrounds it uh, was, was firmly established by 1850. And, and I, I believe Baker, to some small degree, remains a brand. Um, I believe it was owned by Kraft, which is now Mondelez. I don't know. You might you might know that Clay, um, the sort of current state of the Baker brand. Well, you know, Baker's chocolate. You can walk into you know grocery stores pretty much anywhere in the United States, and you will see Baker's chocolate, um, you know, on the shelves. And I think most people, when they think about Baker's chocolate, and they think about um, many people, their sort of first experience with unsweetened chocolate is, you know, in their homes, you know, going into the, the kitchen cupboard, finding this box of chocolate, and then taking a piece out and, you know, hoping that mom won't notice that one of these squares is missing, biting down on it and immediately spitting it out because not only is it unsweetened, but it is also quite acidic and um, is actually, um, it is actually not very, highly refined and when you think about it i mean that makes sense i mean you're looking at something a chocolate which is going to be used in um, a, a recipe which has got a chemical leavening agent in it and you want the acidity of the chocolate to contribute it to the leavening and if you're putting the chocolate in something that's got flour in it you don't need to refine the cocoa um, you, you know to a particle size that is finer than the size of a flour particle that, that's amazing, Clay, because I, I thought I was the only one who had that same exact story, um, that experience early on with Baker's chocolate and, and that slight repulsion of it. Um, that's really funny. No, I, I remember I remember very, very clearly doing that and going, you know, it, the subterfuge of going up there and, and sneaking around and getting this this little block of chocolate was definitely not worth did there was the payoff wasn't worth the effort that was the effort involved in, in making it happen and, and covering it covering it up. Um, 
But you know, if we can, you know, really, really briefly, I think that one of the things we might say about what Baker did, although, you know, we've talked about the fact that in New York we would have advertised Newport chocolate or Boston chocolate. One of the things that we might say about why Baker became dominant, as you say, is that they found a way not just to manufacture, so this talks about scale, but also a way to package the product so that it became easy to sell it beyond um, 100 miles from where it was manufactured. Yeah, and you know, there, there's a lot of things we could, we could throw into the mix. Um, you know, I, you might theorize that, that Boston chocolate makers um, operated during the Revolutionary War and, and persisted after, um, partly due to the fact that for, for most of that period, Boston was a safe harbor. Um, it was not blockaded or occupied by the British like New York was. You know, the New York uh, economy during the Revolution was just battered um, because it remained in British hands. There was there was an exodus of a lot of its population, um, and and really, it's the 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 emergence from the Revolutionary War period and the early Federal period that New York really starts to grow. I mean, I think prior to that, I think Boston was in terms of population was larger than New York at the time. Um, but, but post-revolution, things, things changed dramatically. So, you know, Boston does have this early reputation and that probably also helped firm up um, um, both the business and the legend of, of Baker. But we, we even see early on um, into the 19th century that, that Baker starts to absorb some of the the smaller chocolate makers in the Boston area um, over time too. Gotcha. Thank you. Um, gotcha. Thank you very much for that, Michael. And at which point I want to say um, that we've come to the end of a fascinating hour talking about the history of cocoa and chocolate in a New York state of mind um, with special guest Michael Lysconis, uh, who is going to be leading us through over the next four weeks um, from the period 1800 to the present day.